Hi, welcome. I'm Danielle Todd, and I am a librarian with the Hawaii State Public Library System. Thank you for joining our virtual program, Underwater Volcanoes, which is part of our summer reading challenge, Ocean of Possibilities. Today, we'll be learning about underwater or submarine volcanoes with two special guests, Uncle Dave from the Center for the Study of Active Volcanoes and Mark Mike Zoller from the USGS Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. There will be time for questions and answers at the end of the program, so please put your questions into the Q&A box. Please join me in welcoming Dave and Mike. Aloha. How's everybody this morning? So yeah, I'm, 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 I'm Uncle Dave. I'm with the Center for the Study of Active Volcanoes. And we're based out of UH Hilo. We are a cooperative program. We work in cooperation with uh, UH Hilo Geology Department, University of Manoa Geology Department, and USGS, our friends at Hawaii Volcanoes Observatory. Mike, yeah. How's it, brother Mike? So I, I'm I'm gonna get the the program started. I'm I'm gonna do a a short introduction on volcanoes. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, get ready, folks. Hold on. We're entering the vortex. There we go. Oh, right on. Okay, so when, whenever we talk about volcanoes, we got to talk about plate tectonics. So our Earth is a sphere, right? We have the core, the mantle, the crust. We can break it down even further. The inner core, the outer core. Then you have the lower mantle, the mesosphere. Then the upper mantle, the esthenosphere. And above that is the lithosphere where the crust rests upon. Now, I know you guys are going, oh, man, because I, I, I work with students, and sometimes that's a lot to remember. You're using big words. So sometimes I like to, I, I, there's things that I do to help me visualize, to help me remember. And there's some really great lessons out there. And I, I, a few years ago, I came across this lesson from the University of Oregon. They, they were talking about earthquakes and, and plate tectonics. And they used an Oreo cookie to kind of, yeah, it gives you that visual of our earth. The earth, a big Oreo cookie. Oh, my goodness. Where's my coffee? Where's my coffee? Coffee and Oreo cookies. Anyhow, focus, focus. So, yeah, that lower part would be our lower mantle, the mesosphere. The creamy filling, the esthenosphere, and then you have the upper part of the cookie, the lithosphere, and the crust would rest upon that. You'll never look at an Oreo cookie the same now. And if people ask you what you learned today, you can say, get me a bag of Oreo cookies and I'll show you. Anyhow, it's moving right along. So here's a map. So, Plate tectonics. Yeah, there was a time, you know, people thought a lot of things like the earth was flat, um, one solid piece. We now know that the crust that rests upon the lithosphere is bro broken up into these pieces. So plate tectonics, tectonics from the Greek word tecton which means architect or builder. And it's the study of the large features. So the ocean basins, the continents, mountain ranges. 
yeah, we, we now know it, it, these pieces, they move too. They move. So in some areas, like I'm going to, let's go to the Pacific Plate right here. And, and Hawaii is on the center of the plate. Now, most volcanoes are on the edges of the plates. And when Uncle Mike, when I turn it over to Uncle Mike, he's going to go more in detail. But yeah, we see like right up here, the Aleutian Trench. Oh my goodness. Yeah, a lot of volcanic activity. And what's happening here is the plates are moving together. And the Pacific plate, kind of like Uncle David, I guess maybe had too many Oreo cookies and coffee. It's heavy. So it's going under the North American plate. It's subducting. It's a subduction area. And then still on the Pacific plate, this area, the San Andreas fault area. This area is what we call a transform boundary. And the plate is actually slipping past in this area. Yeah, the pieces are broken. Oh my goodness. So there's still one more area I want to talk about that's going to lead right into our main theme. And I'm so excited, man. Uncle Mike is awesome. Awesome. Double shaka, Uncle Mike. Anyhow, let, let's, let's go to the, the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Ridge. This area is a divergent boundary. Divergent meaning it's moving apart because there's so many volcanoes under the water. Oh, man. It, Uncle Mike, let, let, let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing my screen. We can come back to my screen after. Let's talk about those underwater volcanoes. Okay. Oops. Okay. Dave, are you seeing my slides right now? I'm seeing your slides. Great. Thank, thank you, Uncle Dave. I hope, I hope nobody's going to be a little bit too disappointed because Uncle Dave's a dad, and I'm not, so I'm not going to have as good dad jokes as him. But I'll try. Yeah, I'll try I, my best. Hey, to keep, hey Mike, I, I got a dad joke for you, though. I got a dad joke. Let's hear it. Let's hear it, Dave. Because we're talking about plate tectonics. So two volcanoes are having lunch. And the first volcano notices the second volcano is not eating its lunch. So the first volcano goes, brother, how, co how come you're not eating your lunch? And the second volcano goes, because my plate's broken. Da, da, da. Ah. I can't top that. I, I'm not even going to try to top that. No, no chance. <laughs> Just, just a quick introduction about me before we get into the, the, the fun stuff. Uh, so yeah, my name is Mike Zoller. I'm a geologist at the USGS Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. Um, and so I do, uh, I, I do studies of the active volcanoes here in Hawaii, uh, some research projects on them and, uh, and monitoring to, to help keep people of the island, this island safe from the volcanic activity. Um, and part of that is studying, um, part, part of my job is studying the interactions between our volcanoes and the ocean, which is obviously such an important part of life here in Hawaii. And this is a, this is a very similar map to the one that, that uh, Uncle Dave just showed us, showing all the volcanoes of the world. Um, and as you can see here, with, from these red lines out in the ocean, really most of the volcanoes around the world are underwater. Uh, and most of them group along those divergent plate boundaries that Uncle Dave was talking about. Um, and as we move on to the next slide here, um, most of those volcanoes along the divergent plate boundaries consist of pillow lavas. So as that ocean crust spreads apart on the bottom of the ocean floor, something has to come up and fill the, the void space that's left in between. 
Um, and that's lava in the form of these pillows that you see here. Uh, the reason why the lava takes this form underwater is because um, a hot lava is very rapidly getting cooled on its outside by the very cold ocean water on the ocean floor. So it gets a, it gets a very hard crust very quickly and then it just expands from the inside out as new molten lava is injected inside. And in this picture here, uh, most of these pillows that you're seeing are probably several feet wide. Uh, they can be quite large. They can also be quite small, but the ones you're seeing here are probably like four to five feet across. And uh, so as Uncle Dave was saying, we don't always have volcanoes along divergent and convergent plate boundaries. We also have hotspot volcanoes in the middle of the ocean plate like we do here in Hawaii. Um, so they're a little bit different, uh, but in the case of our underwater volcanoes here in Hawaii, they're also made up of pillow lavas. And the, the best example of this is Kamehua Kanaloa Volcano. Uh, this is offshore from the, the Big Island on the southeast side. It used to be known as Loihi, and some of the maps that I'm going to show here next uh, still refer to it as Loihi. But the new name that was recently given to it this past year is Kamehua Kanaloa. And this is a 3D image of it underwater. Um, and on this next slide, I have a map here showing where it is. So Kamehua uh, Kanalo or Luihi is about 20 to 30 miles offshore on the southeast side of the Big Island, probably closest to the town of Pahala. Uh, and its surface is about three to 4,000 feet below sea level. Um, and it continues, it continues to grow and it continues to erupt. Um, we know that because our land-based instruments that are on the island of Hawaii to monitor uh, volcanoes like Kilauea and Mauna Loa, they sometimes pick up earthquakes out there. And the best example of this was in the year 1996, when there was a large earthquake swarm out there, and hundreds of earthquakes per day were felt in July and August of that year. Um, this graph here shows uh, a plot of those earthquakes, but there were almost none in early July, and then it very rapidly jumped late in July of that month to, um, to 40 to 50 every six hours, so more than 100 a day. For a little while there. Um, and some of these earthquakes were even felt by residents on the Big Island. Um, none of them were terribly strong, but they could feel little tremors in their houses. And very interestingly, uh, after that, that big earthquake swarm, um, a group of scientists uh, from, from my observatory and some universities went out there with, with a submarine to go down and look, well, what happens? Like, there were all these earthquakes. You know, what, and we, we don't have a good way to see what's going on three to 4,000 feet below sea level until, unless we go down and look at it. So they send a submarine down and at the top of Kamehua Kanaloa, there was a new pit crater. It was not there when, the last time they had been there before the eruption. And so they found this little pit crater, which they named Pele's Pit. It's about, um, it's about half a mile across. So you can fit two Aloha stadiums inside this pit just to give you a sense of how big it is. Uh, two, two large football stadiums in here. Um, so this is the best example of the Kamehua Kanaloa eruption. Uh, but we also pick up small activity out there. Um, we've also picked up small act activity out there in the years since. And uh, that suggests that it's still growing with, with small lava flows. Um, and Kamehua Kanaloa is projected to eventually become the next Hawaiian island in somewhere around 100,000 years. Some people think it could be as short as 10,000 years. Some people think it could be as long as 250,000 years. But the bottom line is it's going to be a very long time. And unfortunately, none of us are going to get to see it. You got to go down in a submarine if you want to get, get a look at this volcano. Um, in addition to um, monitoring the eruptions, we also have done some interesting research out there uh, because uh, this volcano is one of the first to ever be monitored uh, on the ocean floor. Uh, so in the late 1990s, after that big eruption, scientists became really interested in Kamehua Kanaloa, and they sent instruments down to sit on the volcano on the ocean floor. This is one of the first times this was ever done. Uh, it was called Hugo, the Hawaii Undersea Geo Observatory, and there was a lot of really cool, cool science that came out of this. Uh, Got to see new earthquakes that we wouldn't have picked up from, from our land-based instruments. Uh, got, to, got to pick up um, different uh, emissions of hot water coming from, from the volcano on the ocean floor. It was a very, very interesting project. Now, it's also important to remember that um, even the volcanoes that are not fully below sea level, close to sea level, such as the ones here on the 
island of Hawaii can also do some interesting things when they interact with the ocean water. Um, so this is a picture from the Kilauea volcano eruption in, in the year 2018, the big one that did so much damage in Lower Puna, unfortunately. And you can see here uh, some of the lava flows from that eruption going into the ocean. And this next slide, I have a closer up photo of that. Um, and uh, fortunately, uh, I, I took this photo from a helicopter. We weren't too close to the hot lava in this case. Uh, but in addition to the lava, also dangerous from this is uh, all this steam and gas coming off of the ocean entry where it's going into the water here on the lower left. Because uh, when, when lava mixes with ocean water, it produces hydrochloric acid, which can be very dangerous to people. And so it's very, if you, ever, if you ever get an opportunity to see an erupting volcano up close when it's close to sea level, you don't want to go into these gas clouds. It's very, very dangerous. Uh, but fortunately, um, this area was closed off to the public and we were able to um, fly over it for, for our photos and, and not have to be, put anybody at risk to take these shots. Um, elsewhere around the, the, the world, and especially here in the Pacific, um, there are a number of volcanoes, uh, strato volcanoes that are close to sea level. So our volcanoes here in Hawaii are shield volcanoes that are a little bit flatter. And um, a lot of people think of volcanoes as being those cone-shaped ones that we, that we more commonly call strato volcanoes. And uh, this one in the island nation of Tonga, uh, the volcano being called Hunga Tonga Hunga Haapai, um, this one famously erupted in December and January of this past year. Um, this photo is the picture of the summit of that volcano poking out just above sea level uh, prior to that eruption. Um, so you can imagine this is the very, very top of the volcano uh, sticking out here, um, sticking out here above the waves, but most of it is underwater. Um, and when we have an eruption uh, this close to sea level, it can be very, very explosive. And I have a video on this next slide that can, that can illustrate that. So this is, um, this is a video that came from, uh, that a helicopter collected of that volcano in Tonga um, during the early phases of that eruption in December and January of this past year. These, uh, these big clouds you're seeing are ash clouds. Um, and when magma inside the volcano interacts with seawater, it often flashes the seawater to steam very, very quickly. And it can pulverize that magma into very fine ash fragments and send them high up into the air. In this case, thousands of feet into the air. These are very, very tall eruptions. And these aren't even the biggest ones uh, that occurred at that volcano. You also may note in the, um, the water around the island, you see all this discoloration, these like different hues of green and brown. So all this ash is getting into the ocean and mixing with the water chemistry as well. And that's why you see all these strange colors. We actually saw a very similar thing happen during the 2018 eruption here at Kilauea. So we would see brown water when the lava was going in uh, because it was, um, because it was all these, all these different volcanic particles getting mixed in with the, the normal ocean water. I'll let this video finish. I think it's almost done. Yeah, it was a very, very large explosion. Fortunately, we haven't seen anything of that size here in Hawaii, but at these strato volcanoes that are close to sea level, we can, and I'll let the early part of the video play again here just because it was so dramatic. You see like initial burst of all that ash falling to the ground and then you see a taller one come out right here. Fascinating stuff. I'd love to get to see one of these in person someday, but uh, yeah, I, yeah for, fortunately we won't, we won't have that opportunity here in Hawaii. Moving on, um, as I said, that wasn't even the biggest explosion from that eruption in Tonga. Um, this is a satellite view of that, uh, of, of that same volcano on January 15th of this past year. Um, and you see a giant ash cloud emerge from the ocean and spread into the atmosphere. And in this video here, um, just to give you a sense of scale, that ash cloud is 300 miles wide. So imagine an ash cloud extending from the big island here where I'm sitting all the way to Honolulu and even past it. Um, so it was very, very large eruption. This is the largest one since the 1990s in the entire world. Um, a very, very dramatic eruption and uh, a very fascinating event for scientists to study. It sent a shockwave all around the world that was, that was even heard in Alaska. Um, and I was talking about that ash fall coming out. Um, fortunately, that island that uh, the volcano erupted from, nobody was living there. It was, it was, too, it was too dangerous and, and folks in Tonga were, were wise enough to not try to live there. Uh, but there were some nearby islands that 
and did receive some of this ash fall. When the cloud is that big, um, it's gonna it's gonna blanket a lot of places nearby with ash. And this is a town on one of the nearby islands in Tonga, and you can see how everything is gray here, and there's there's gray stuff in the ocean water, and that's that's several inches of ash that fell on this area. Um, and Tonga, the entire country was cut off from the outside world for several days because um, this eruption uh, cut the uh, the internet cables to the islands. Uh, so the only way that people could communicate with them was by flying in on planes. There were people you couldn't call on the phone, you couldn't go on the internet to, to message anybody in Tonga. Um, so they had to go in, and uh, uh, there was a there was fortunately a lot of people from the United States and from New Zealand reached out to the Tongans to help them in this situation because it was a very trying time for them. Um, and then they were finally able to get back on their feet several, several weeks later. Uh, but that, that event wasn't just threatening to the folks in Tonga because um, that, that eruption was so powerful that it even produced a tsunami that affected the entire Pacific Ocean Basin. We often associate uh, tsunamis with large earthquakes, such as the one in Japan in 2011, or, or ones in Alaska or in Chile. Um, but this event was a good reminder that even volcanic eruptions in the Pacific Basin can cause tsunamis. Um, this map here shows the travel times for that tsunami as it went across the Pacific Ocean. Um, and you can see um, the, in the blue star here being the, the Hunga Tonga Hunga Ha Pai volcano there where it, where it originated. And then up here where this 51407 number is, that's, that's Hawaii. Um, that's one of the seismometer instruments here in Hawaii that was that was detecting um, the, the waves from that eruption. Um, and you can see here that it took about six to eight hours for those waves to reach from Tonga here to Hawaii. Fortunately, the wave was very small. It was only like two to three feet tall, so it didn't do a lot of damage here. But this event was a good reminder that these volcanic eruptions elsewhere in the Pacific can pose a small threat to us here in Hawaii. And we have to keep an eye on these tsunamis, uh, whether they be from volcanoes or from earthquakes, because that's always going to be um, a slight threat to us here on the islands. I think that's everything I have. I, I'm sorry I don't have a good dad joke to transition back to Dave, but I think he has a few more slides uh, to, to, show, uh, to show us some more about volcanoes right now. <laughs> Dave, can you start sharing again? I'm trying to get out of it. <laughs> How's that? Wow, Mike. That is awesome, Mike. Thank you so much. Wow. Yeah. So, okay, we're, we're, we're going to get back into... We're going to do an exper experiment now um, that, that you can do. And at home, and parents, caretakers, guardians, th this is supposed to be like a no mess volcano because you take it outside. Okay, so let me. It's a backyard volcano. There we go. Um, I'm back to sharing the screen. Make sure I share my sound. Okay, um, so yeah, just kind of to, oh, there we go again. So ju just review, so volcanoes are openings or vents where rocks and steam er erupt. So here we have the magma chamber. Okay, so there's partial melt melting. There's that word again. Asthenosphere, magma rises into the crust, and then it comes out of our volcano. And that, oh man, those videos were awesome, Mike. Wow. Okay, so we can make a volcano in our yard. We can make a volcano in our yard. Well, these are the different types of, these are the types that I, when in my presentations that I talk about shield volcanoes, seal, cinder, and composite. There's another volcano. It's the happy volcano, the backyard volcano. And what you'll need, these are the materials, a plastic paper cup, 
cup of baking soda, one cup of vinegar, one cup of water, a teaspoon of dish soap, red food coloring, which you will add to the vinegar, and then two empty water or soda bottles. And, you know, if you have some dinosaurs or Monopoly houses laying around, that's good too. So you can put it on your volcano. Okay. So we're going to mix one cup of baking soda into one cup of water. And there's these are my two youngest kids. This is Manny and Shady. One day they were very bored. There's nothing to do. So we, we did this out in the yard. Actually, it's a backyard experience, but we were in the front yard because there was an area. Don't let them know. There was an area that I wanted them to pull weeds. <laughs> so I got them to pull weeds in that area. Anyhow. And then next step, you're going to add one teaspoon of dish soap and shake it up. Make sure it's mixed up thoroughly. Now, make sure you label. This is very important. Especially, you know, we, we teach our students in the labs, you label your ingredients, okay? Very good. If you come across something that's unlabeled and you don't know what it is, then you treat it as something that can harm you, okay? And so you get an adult and, and, and take it from there, figure it out. But always label your stuff. Okay, now pour one cup of vinegar into the other empty water soda bottle, add a few drops of red food coloring and shake it up. Kind of like an earthquake. If you start to feel the ground shake, you wanna drop, cover and hold on. Okay, then you find an area in your yard with cinder, rocks or dirt and place the plastic cup on the ground. So they, they went in this area. Oh, yeah, they did such a good job of pulling the weeds in that area. Start building their volcano. So you take the empty cups and you kind of build around it. So the next step, kind of getting towards the ending, you would pour the baking soda, water, dishwashing solution into the cups. And then here's a video. Let's see what happens. Hi, Dave, I don't want to interrupt you, but um, we aren't hearing the sound. Can you check the sound real quick? Uh, you know what? Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll talk through it. Sounds uh, good. So, yeah, sorry about the sound. Um, so what, what they're doing now is, so a lot of times before an earthquake, the precursor is the volcano will start to decast. But you also get a lot of little earthquakes that increase. So my son was hitting the ground. And so if we suspect there's going to be an eruption, we're going to start getting people to evacuate the area. So that's what they're doing with the dinosaurs. They're leaving the area. Yeah, now volcanoes don't just erupt at the caldera at the top, it can erupt anywhere along its rift zone. So, boom, there was the first one. And sometimes, yeah, you can have multiple eruptions. Boom, and that was our 
backyard. Well, in this case, again, it was in our front yard. And no mess, really easy to clean up. And afterwards, we planted some flowers. Yeah, right on. So I know this video is going to be up. Um, I can share some links to this experiment. Um, yeah, there's some, there's some other awesome educational links. Again, whenever I need information on volcanoes and earthquakes, one of my favorite places to go for that information is USGS. Yes, yes, sir. And so, but again, there's some other links here. And with that said, we all pow, as we say in Hawaii, all pow. And we don't like to say goodbye. We say ahu we ho until we meet again. Until we meet again. So I, I think there's some time for questions and answers. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was really fun and informative. And we do have a couple questions. And if anybody has more questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box and I'll read them out for everybody. Everybody. So our, so our first question was about the Pele pit. Um, and there was specifically, are there any drawings of humans near that pit? Or if you could tell us about the size of the Pele pit, um, Mike? Uh, not, not as far as I know, but it, um, let me see if I can pull that back up again, uh, sure. just to better, to better illustrate that. Um, I should, I should be sharing again in a moment and we should be. All right, we should be seeing, uh, there we go. There, there's Pele's pit again. Um, I, yeah, it, so there's, there is a, there's a scale bar here on the right side of this image, half a kilometer. So um, that's, about, that's about a third of, I'm sorry, that's, that's two thirds of a mile um, right there. Um, that if, if, if we were to put like a person in this image for scale, they would be smaller than one of the specs in these X's. That's how small they would be. So this is a very, very large pit. Not as not quite as big as Halemaumau at, at the some of Kilauea. It's not quite that big, but it's a little bit, it, it, it's, it's quite large. I would maybe compare this in size to um, like, like Pahi Crater or, um, or like Napao Crater on the on the Kilauea East Rift Zone would be a, a good example for the size of this one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, that kind of gives an idea of how big it is. It's it's pretty big. <laughs> um, um, we also had a question related to the Tonga eruption. Um, I'm not familiar with this, but with the New Zealand White Island eruption, is that similar? Or if you know about that one? Yes, yeah, so the, the the New Zealand White Island eruption is is unfortunately famous uh, because because several people several people on a on a volcano viewing tour died uh, during that eruption um, and the the video I showed which I'll I'll play again um, th this video of the Tonga eruption you're seeing here is it, this is actually a very similar type of eruption to the one that occurred at White Island in New Zealand um, that one at, that one at White Island yeah it was, it was another low uh, low-level island, uh, very close to sea level, that had an explosive lava water interaction um, with a with a similar ash uh, cloud size to what we're seeing right here. Um, and uh, yeah, that was that was a very notable event for us volcanologists because obviously the the loss of life highlighted for us the importance of studying these volcanoes and being able to to issue timely warnings to to folks who live in these areas or maybe visiting them that. Um, it's, it's, it's time to get out of there if, if things are ramping up and there might be a large eruption like the one that we're seeing right here. <laughs> Good 
Good. Thank you for answering that. Um, we did have a question. I think people are interested in doing the experiment. So um, Uncle Dave, um, I know you sent me the slides. Is it okay if we post those so people can have the ingredients to do the experiment at home? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and and there are, there are you know, you, if you type in backyard volcano, um, you do a Google search. There, there's some other sites that have have listed awesome. all the stuff. So I'm gonna put into the chat. We are gonna, like I said, this is recorded. It takes us about a week to process everything and make sure we have the closed captions done because we want everybody to be able to enjoy. Um, but if you go to our YouTube, you can view our old um, previous recorded events, and that's also where we'll put this one up. And everyone who registered is gonna get a direct link to it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and, 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 you know, again, we, we have my contact info is on our, our, our website. And if people have like later on, people have questions, um, they can contact me via the center for the study of active volcanoes. And, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Um, we do have a question, not about submarine volcanoes, but could you talk a little bit about fissure eight? Oh boy, we talk about Fisher 8 for a very, very long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so those, those, those pictures I showed of, um, of the Kilauea eruption in 2018, those weren't of Fisher 8 itself, but those were of the lava flows that came out of Fisher 8 and, and went to the ocean. Um, so obviously Fisher 8 was the main eruptive event that fed the eruption. Um, and uh, its main phase of activity lasted from May 28th to August 5th. Uh, with a little bit of residual activity until September 5th. Um, but um, I guess the key takeaway, though, is that we, we've been monitoring the Lower East Rift Zone for the, the four years since that eruption, and uh, we've detected very low levels act of activity, and there are, there are no signs of the eruption down there resuming anytime soon. Um, so I, I think everybody can breathe easy in the Lower East Rift Zone for right now. <laughs> That's good to hear. Yeah. 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 Um, so we have another question. Um, where is the best volcanic rock museum in Hawaii? I might let Dave answer that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so your yard. <laughs> no, <laughs> our, you know, that, that's a good question. Sometimes I have like, I have, you know, and not, not to be, it's not to be sarcastic or anything, but sometimes people ask me, like, where's the volcano? And I'll be like, you're standing on it, you know? <laughs> so, our, but yeah, you know, Lyman House Museum, Lyman House Museum has an excellent, excellent rock and mineral collection. And of course, and then going up to the National Park, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And, and when you do go into the park though, do not, do not remove any rocks. Okay, do not. Um, but yeah, uh, and you, when, you, when you go into the park, take pictures and leave only footprints and, and take memories, you know, that, that's what I tell uh, people. But yeah. Uh, Ly Lyman House Museum. And just so it, if we don't have people from Big Island, um, Lyman House is in Hilo, right? It's in Hilo. Okay. And then Making all sure. things uh, tsunamis. I, I want to give uh, the Pacific Tsunami Museum a plug. Um, all things tsunamis and, er you know, you can go and learn about earthquakes. Please check them out, too. And, and there's links in, in the video at the end, that end sheet, there is a link to Pacific Tsunami Museum. Yeah, and I'll be sure that, again, we're gonna upload the whole PowerPoint so you can click on the links when the recording's out. So everybody can go check out all the great awesome, resources. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. And, yeah, and then, you know, the library, the, the library, Hawaii Public Library, I tell you, Hilo Public Library in, in particular, is very special to me because my whole interest in volcanoes and earthquakes and tsunamis began as a little child when I was like seven. We had that big earthquake, the Halape earthquake. And that was in 1975. 75 was a, a tough year for me. Um, and I'll spare the details, but 
my basically what, what happened is my dad passed away in July, and then in November we had this earthquake, and I I had so many questions, and I remember my mom couldn't answer it, so she she was like, "Ask your teacher in school," and I went to school, and my teacher was like, "Well, you know what? Maybe you should go to the library, borrow books." And yeah, Hawaii Public, I ended up Hawaii Public Library borrowing books, books that were my age. And so, yeah, I encourage everybody listening to this. If this is something that's, that this subject has interest you, sparked the interest, please visit our Hawaii Public Library. And, and they have books on rocks and minerals too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, we there's a lot of great materials. Thanks for giving a shout out to us. We appreciate it. Um, we have a few more questions to get through, and I want to make sure we get them answered. Uh, thank you for sharing your story. That was really lovely. Um, has the oldest Hawaiian slash hot spot volcano subducted under the Aleutians? And if so, how many have subducted? That's a, that's a really fascinating question. And um, unfortunately, there's... Uh, there's no evidence for us to know for sure, but probably yes. Yeah, in all in all likelihood, the hotspot yeah. was was even older than than the oldest of the seamounts that's up there close to the Aleutians, like the very end of the Hawaiian chain. Uh, but we don't have any way to know how many subducted. It, it, the, the hotspot has probably been around for a very very long time, maybe even since the origins of the Earth, uh, four billion years. But uh, there's just no evidence for us to know for sure. Yeah, you have to think in terms of geological time. And so, yeah, millions of years. It, it, no one was around, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to wrap your head around the yeah. amount of time. Yeah. Um, yeah to, to, put, to put that in perspective, the oldest of the main Hawaiian islands, Kauai, about 4 million years old. But... <laughs> The entire Earth, four billion years old, so a thousand times older than. Right. than yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, so we have another question. Um, this one relates to Mauna Kea and what will happen when or if Mauna Kea erupts. It's a good. It's a good question, and I mean, just it's important to preface any answer about Mauna Kea in that it last erupted four thousand years ago, which. Compared to the other timescales that we were just talking about, it seems really short, but is actually pretty long compared to the other volcanoes here on the island. So we're not really expecting Mauna Kea to erupt in our lifetimes. It's probably going to be asleep for a very long, long time before it erupts again. But I will say that the evidence is that when it erupts, its eruptions tend to be smaller and not as long lived as the ones that happen on Kilauea and Mauna Loa, the more active. More, more, more cinder cone type eruptions, which right. as you drive between the two Maunas, you see the evidence of that, the, the cinder cones. Um, I just saw something come up in cha um, chat since you have mentioned Mauna Loa. Is there a chance that Mauna Loa would erupt? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, we, we will probably we will probably see Mount Aloha erupt again in our lifetimes. Um, mm. it, it 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 averages an eruption every four to five years, and the last one was uh, coming up on forty years ago. Now that's not to say it's necessarily overdue. Volcanoes don't necessarily work like that. They're going to erupt when they're going to erupt. Um, but the, the long-term average is that it erupts a lot more often than, than we have seen, at least in the most recent decades. Uh, so we, we, we keep monitoring and we would expect it to erupt sometime in, in the future. Yeah. Mauna Loa, for example, I've lived on this island all my life and um, Mauna Loa has erupted twice in my lifetime, 75 and 84. Awesome. So just to ease anybody's minds, Mike, you stress that's kind of what you guys do. You monitor things and make their, sure everything's good, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Just wanna make sure if there's any kids out there, <laughs> get, people are looking into it. Um, this is an interesting question. Uh, what is the first plant to emerge um, from a recently erupted volcano? So once the lava's cooled and the plants come back in, is there plants that we usually see coming through? Uh, you know, a lot of times you'll see the the ferns 
ferns mm-hmm. and and you know with the birds they they're dropping seeds so ohia trees moss mm-hmm. yeah good question that was a good question um and then I know you mentioned it in the presentation, but just how long will it take for Loihi to form? And I also wanted to ask about when was the name changed? The name the name was changed last year because um, the, the original name Loihi was something that a scientist just made up. But then they consulted a Kapuna Council of Hawaiian elders and they, mm-hmm. they settled on Kamehua Kanaloa as a more appropriate Hawaiian name for, uh, for, the, for the submarine volcano. And so, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the fastest estimates are that it would, it would become a new island in 10,000 years, but the more prolonged estimates are that it would take 100,000 years or longer. Um, it, it all depends on the, the rate you assume it's growing at. And it's, it's hard to know that for sure because of how far it is below sea level. Um, yeah, it, it's very variable, but none of us are going to get to see it. Yeah. Um, okay, I just got another question. Is there sea life found nearby underwater volcanoes or what type of life would be down there? That's a that's a great question. And I, I'm not a biologist, so I, I can't I can't speak to the specifics, but I do know that um because these these underwater volcanoes are sources of heat at, at um, at great ocean depths, which are typically very cold areas, they do attract a lot of life forms. I know like tube worms and then certain Dave. species of fish. Yeah, yeah, Dave, maybe you know more. Go ahead. Well, I'm, I, I, again, I'm not a biologist, but I, I, yeah, certain um, shrimp and certain types of fish. Mm-hmm. That, w- that would be a good, uh, another another talk (laughs) i think so i think we might need to look into that that'd be fascinating um and i do know that there were books about it at your local public library if you wanted to go look up about deep sea creatures there's a lot of really interesting things out there about that um i do see a question about the different types of volcano can you show that again real quick dave or if not give an idea of where we could look at it okay so yeah i had that and again it was a in another PowerPoint that I do, um, I have actual volcanoes that I kind of bring up, but oops. Is that slide there? Yeah, so you have shield volcanoes, cinder volcanoes, composite volcanoes, um, even dome volcanoes. Mike, <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's a lot of different types of volcanoes, but in my talks, I tend to focus on these three. And so the island that we're on, our volcanoes are shield. And then we have, uh, again, cinder volcanoes that form on these shield volcanoes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for sharing with that with us again. Yeah, it helps to kind of visualize the different things. So I don't see any more questions coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. Things up. Um, um, As I said, you can expect to see the recording of this. We're going to send the link out in about a week. um, And you can view our other programs on our YouTube channel. Um, There's still time to join our summer reading challenge, which is an ocean of possibilities. Um, And I'm going to put the link to all of that in our chat. So you can go to our website. If you ever want to find anything about the libraries, go to libraryshawaii.org. This is a direct direct link to our summer reading challenge information. Um, But thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, We're really excited to keep learning more. Um, and Dave, did you, were you trying to say something real quick? Well, I got another dad joke. Oh, perfect. You, you said oceans. Mm-hmm. You said oceans and it just kind of popped into my head. Oh no. Are, are you guys ready for the dad joke? Let's hear it. How do, how do, how do oceans say goodbye? 
How? They wave. Uh, <laughs> I can't top that. Wave. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. I know I learned a lot and I think other people did too. Um, have a great day, everyone. And um, we'll see you soon. Bye.